needs a little introduction, but I'll do a quick, quick one. He was uh, leader of the Conservative Party for 11 years and Prime Minister for six years, an eternity by today's standards, of course, um, and also became Prime Minister by facing and winning two general elections, another rarity by uh, today's uh, standards. Um, but we're not going to be focusing too much on his time in office and politics, but rather the thing he's, uh, of many endeavours, perhaps thrown himself at most passionately uh, since leaving office, and, and that is uh, as president of Alzheimer's Research uh, UK, and dementia was a topic he did look at a lot when uh, Prime Minister as well. And since becoming president of Alzheimer's Research UK, a relatively short space uh, of time, he's uh, already raised £20 million, and he also, which we'll come to, chairs the Board of Early Detection of Neurodegenerative uh, Diseases, uh, which is an important part of, uh, of his passion for this uh, topic, which uh, I'm sure we will now get to hear a lot more about. Please join me in welcoming uh, David Cameron. That's great. That's lovely. Well, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then you can... It's, it's good to be grilled by a frost. That hasn't happened for a while, so I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Um, lovely to be with you um, this morning. Uh, I, was, I was all in favour of longevity, actually, until yesterday. Um, I was at the Cenotaph, and, you know, being one of four ex-Prime Ministers was quite special, but now there are hundreds of us. It doesn't <laughs> have nearly the appeal. But I suppose there's another way of looking at longevity, which is I was in uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia recently, and was reading about the incredible comeback of President Mahathir, who came back as Prime Minister aged 92. Now, I am 56. That means I've got 36 <laughs> years to go before my comeback. So that is a very good reason. But I want to talk to you about um, Alzheimer's and about um, dementia, because I think it's very central to what you're looking at. In fact, I would argue if we can't find an answer to the dementia crisis, then there's no point in longevity. Uh, we'll find more and more people slipping into this world of darkness, and a long life will not be a happy life because many, many years will be spent in this appalling darkness. And I was just, in, by way of introduction, was going to do a sort of why Alzheimer's, why me, and why now? Why Alzheimer's? Well, very simply, I mean, dementia is now, I would argue, the number one health crisis. It's becoming the number one killer. It's becoming the most expensive condition that we face. It now costs more than cancer. It costs more than heart disease. It costs more than stroke. I'm not going to blind you with figures, but this is a country of 60 million people. Soon we'll have one million people with dementia. It is a massive crisis in terms of cost, in terms of um, the carnage it's causing. And, of course, more than those figures is the emotional carnage when you see uh, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a child sometimes even, slipping into this world of darkness from which there is no recovery. So I think it is an absolutely number one health concern, not just for the UK, but for the whole world. Globally, 55 million people with dementia, and that's almost certainly an underestimate because it's under-diagnosed. Um, uh, why me? Well, obviously I can tell you about how as Prime Minister, we made dementia a G8 priority. It was the G8 then, before we sensibly kicked out Putin. I can tell you about how we doubled the research budget in, in government into dementia, which was a good thing to do. Um, but more than anything, actually, I got really involved because of my own embarrassment about my ignorance. I think, like many people, I thought, well, dementia, it's really just sort of part of aging. It's something that happens when you get old. It isn't. Dementia is caused by diseases of the brain, of which Alzheimer's is the most prominent. And so just as we are curing other diseases, we are radically reducing heart disease, we're getting close to defeating a lot of different cancers, so we should be equally targeted on dealing with this disease of the brain. And it was that understanding of my ignorance that combined with going around my own constituency and seeing people slip into this world of darkness, that gave me the passion to set it as a national priority and to make it my main thing on leaving office, which Wilfred uh, kindly uh, pointed to. And the political has now become personal. My mother has an Alzheimer's um, diagnosis. She's 88 years old. And, and obviously, it's heartbreaking seeing someone you love slip into this world where their memory gets so destroyed. And, and the, the fascinating thing about it is 
you know, as that journey starts and continues, if only you could do something just to stop it, not to reverse it, but just to stop it getting worse, so many people would have so much more of a quality of life. Why now, finally, of my trio of why Alzheimer's, why me, why now? Why now? Well, I think there are three things happening that actually make this a very exciting time to be involved in the fight um, against dementia. The first is, while up to now, there's been a whole string of failures in terms of drugs and treatments and all the rest of it, we have now got 150 or so drugs in trial. And while there's been quite a high-profile failure today, just announced by Roche, um, there have been some quite high-profile successes. And in the world of um, science and discovery, even if a drug isn't 100% successful, even if it begins to show some sort of uh, progress, which we have with a drug called lecanumab, I wish these scientists could find better names for drugs, but nonetheless, <laughs> they all seem to end in ab and have incredibly a lot of syllables in the middle. Um, you know, there's some signs that it is targeting these protein plaques that build up in the brain and there's some signs that if you can get rid of those protein plaques, you can stop uh, or potentially even over time reverse the cognitive impairment that is at the heart of Alzheimer's and then the condition of dementia. So once you get one drug, people get very excited and the money pours in. So that's reason one for being excited. The second is this thing that I'm chairing, which is called the early detection of neurodegenerative diseases. And what we're doing is we're basically combining the best of science with the best of tech and the best of big data. We've got 60 people working across 39 different universities all over the world, basically trying to work out what are the fingerprints, what are the signs that you might be getting one of these neurodegenerative diseases. Not from brain scans and blood tests, although of course we'll do those, but from the way you sleep, from the way you walk, from the way you talk, from the way you use your iPhone or your computer. And we're beginning to see that these fingerprints can be as accurate a predictor as looking at a brain scan. So that could be a moment of magic where we diagnose people much earlier, we test drugs on people far earlier uh, in the process, and so we reach the answer faster. Third reason to be excited, it's got nothing to do with dementia at all, but is the Vaccines Task Force and the amazing work that Kate Bingham did. Because I think what she proved is that, and I'm generalizing here, in science often things are done in sequence they said, we're too much of a hurry. We've got to do them in parallel. We've got to do them now. We've got to throw money at the problem. We've got to make sure we take faster decisions. And I think getting to a vaccine as quickly as they did, now we should apply that process to this massive health crisis of dementia. Where does this all end? Well, I'm a very simple-minded person. I wasn't allowed to take physics and chemistry and biology um, at O level because I wasn't good enough at science. But I do have a very simple way of putting this to try and get you excited by it, which is every morning, many people my age, in their 50s, wake up and take a little pill. And they take that little pill called a statin because it reduces your cholesterol and it means you're less likely to have a heart attack. And it has been an amazing health intervention. It has helped us to have healthier hearts for longer and fewer people getting a heart attack. What we're after here is a little pill that could help to stop your brain deteriorating. A statin for the brain. So visualize that. Uh, that it may not be in time for me, it may not be in time for all of you, although there's some younger people here. Hopefully it will be in time for people in their 30s, 40s, maybe even 50s, that a pill every day can help to ward off some of these diseases that are destroying brains and ruining lives. So that's what I'm spending my time on. We are small compared to cancer research. We've probably got a fifth many as researchers as they have, even though we're now arguably a, a more important disease and we're, we're less far down the road of curing it. And that's why you need philanthropy, that's why you need governments, because the pharma people will come in, but we need the philanthropy and governments to prime the pump now to make more progress so we crack this disease. That's what I'm devoting myself to these days, that's why I'm here, and that's why the issue of longevity combines with this issue of dementia. No point in having longer lives if you're not really there to enjoy them. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thank you, David. And, and I thought, actually, given what you just said there, it'd be interesting to, to touch on that comparison, for example, to, to cancer and the scale of attention uh, it gets. You've raised this as an issue uh, and its prominence in people's understanding of it massively in government and, and afterwards. Do you feel like 
all of the work on that is done or, or, or where on, on raising the awareness? No, I think we've got a way to go. I mean, if you look at the figures, I love opinion polls, as you can imagine. If you look at the figures, we poll this quite regularly. About 70% of people in the country understand that dementia is caused by diseases and is not a natural part of aging. But that still leaves 30% of people that think it probably is still part of aging. So there's still a bit of PR to be done to say this is, this is, this is caused by diseases we can, we can cure. So I think that's very important. And then if you look at the other statistic, I mean, cancer research is, is many, and they're a brilliant organization, they're hundreds of millions, uh, whereas we are, you know, we raise and spend sort of 40 million uh, a year. So they are more than 10 times our size. They've got a, a many more researchers. And I would say if you think about it like a marathon race, marathon 26 miles, I would say in the battle to sort of cure cancer, we're probably, I don't know, in mile 18 or 19. We're, we can see the winning post. We're going to get there. All sorts of people are now having cancer diagnosed and they're surviving. There are some very tough ones which we're still not cracking. I think with, with the diseases that cause dementia, I'd say we're mile, you know, five or six. We will get to mile 26, but we've still got some really hard yards to do. So that's the, the comparison. And why, the, why all of this matters is, of course, we're quite dependent on people who are leaving university, doing their PhDs, deciding to be researchers. And we need people to decide to go into research uh, in, in terms of dementia. And, and if it looks like a hopeless case, and if people think it's all part of Asia, they won't make that choice. So actually the PR and the money sort of go together. And, and in terms of roles, one of them has been raising money, as I said, 20 million pounds already, fantastically successful at that. The, the other one, or one of many, is, is chairing the board of the Early Detection of Neurodegenerative Diseases Initiative. Um, also could have had a shorter name as well yeah, as the drugs. Yeah, could have. EDON, that's yeah, what we call it, go. EDON. That makes um, it simple. Uh, so, so talk to us a bit about that very proactive role you're, you're taking there and, um, and a bit more about bringing those different, different spheres in and tech companies. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's really... The thing that inspired me about this part of it is, of course, if you're going to find these cures and treatments, you've got to... Tr try and try them out on people at the early stages of the disease. I mean, at the moment, too much of what happens is we find people who've already got Alzheimer's. They probably had it for years before the diagnosis, and then they go into drug trials. And someone put it to me, that's a bit like, you know, testing a cancer drug on someone whose tumor is already the size of a golf ball. And it's that's, you're too late. You need to diagnose early. So the whole point about this exercise is, as I say, is bringing together the best of, of science with the new data and, and tech. So we're going to be using um, wearable technologies on people involved in uh, a longitudinal trials. So they're going to be wearing Fitbits, they're wearing headbands, they're wearing uh, apps on their phones about how they use their phones to draw that data and find these fingerprints so then you can identify people much earlier. And that has really two benefits. One is that gives you cohorts to include in future clinical trials, but also it means when you do find potential cures, you're going to be able to give them to people much earlier. And as I said with my statin example, it's relatively easy to find out who needs a statin. We all do this, you know, health check in our 40s and 50s, and a blood test is taken, they read your cholesterol, and if it's at a certain level, they give you the statin. And it is amazing how that leads to a decline in your cholesterol. Now, it doesn't cut out the risk of heart disease, but it does radically reduce the risk of heart disease. It's been a very effective intervention. And so that's what I think we're looking for in this space too. And you mentioned your earlier remarks engaging with, with big tech on that. And I, in this country, we have some of the best scientists in the world. Sadly, America has most, if not all, of the big successful tech companies the last couple of decades. Have you been able to engage with them? Have they been receptive? Or yes, are they more yes, they have. I mean, so um, uh, Bill Gates is a supporter of EDON, um, and uh, he ha some of his people sit on the board, and he has been helping to fund this because it is absolutely crucial, as you say. There's quite a good sort of British um, backing to this whole venture in that the Dementia Research Institute, the DRI, is here in London at University College London. Obviously, some of the great breakthroughs on DNA and unlocking the secrets of our, our, our biological code were made here in the UK. Some of the best research is going on here in the UK. But you're absolutely right. If you want to marry that up with, with tech, 
you want to access all that expertise I in the United States as well. So with Gates on, I mean, it used to be the case that sort of philanthropists followed governments into philanthropy. Uh, with, with Gates, it's the other way around. Gates decides to put money into you know, vaccines and the mission to get rid of polio and now the mission to, to, to tackle dementia, and others follow him and governments follow him. So it's very powerful to have him on our side. And, and in terms of where the private sector is on this, are you starting to be more encouraged as the vaccine task force changed the, the, the ball game of how much they're willing, at what stage they're willing to start investing, or are you still rather disappointed? Yeah, I, no, I think... Um, there are probably people in the room more expert than me on this. I mean, my understanding of it is that, that the pharmaceutical industry 10, 15 years ago did put quite a lot of effort. There was a sense we were getting closer to um, uh, treatments that could really help with dementia. And there was just a litany of, of failures. And I think what that means is that you, you can't expect the pharmaceutical companies to keep investing when they're too far away from a treatment. So that's why you need philanthropy, you need government, uh, you'll get some support from pharma to get closer to the answer. And that's what EDON is all about. EDON, we're by producing these fingerprints and this incredible database and knowledge about how to diagnose early, we're not keeping that to ourselves. Companies will be able to plug in and use our data. So I think we're at that stage. As soon as we get a bit closer, I think the pharmaceutical industry will pile in. Um, but right now, we're still at the stage where you do need quite a lot of philanthropy and government support to make progress. In terms of that interaction as well and, and the progress that's, that's being made, do, do you go through moments of being in incredibly positive on, on being close to that end goal, then disheartened? Yes, and, and, uh, and yes where are absolutely. We at? I mean, today is a good example. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a set. I think we should always be frank about these things. Today is a setback. Roche had a drug uh, that was meant to be, it, it, in very simple terms, in the world of Alzheimer's dementia, there's a lot of people who put a lot of emphasis on what's called the amyloid hypothesis, which is that we, we know that uh, there's a buildup of plaques in the brain that seems to be associated with the cognitive impairment um, that is at the heart of dementia. In fact, our scientist recently put it very simply to me. He said, look, of course, he said, there are people with buildup of plaques in the brain who don't have dementia, but there's no one with dementia that doesn't have plaques in the brain. What we haven't managed to get absolutely the handle on is the exact causation. And so today's a bad day because Roche have said their drug trial hasn't worked. But interestingly, when you look at what they've said, their drug wasn't particularly good at getting rid of the amyloid plaques in the brain. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that it wasn't that good at dealing with the cognitive impairment. There's another drug, lecanumab, which seems to be quite effective at both getting rid of the plaques and reverse, uh, uh, halting the cognitive impairment. So, you know, you always, you shouldn't get carried away with the news from one drug trial. There are hundreds of drugs now in trial, and of course there's all sorts of stuff outside the amyloid hypothesis. A bunch of scientists who say, no, no, that's not going to be the answer. There are loads of other things we should look at in terms of um, the breakdown of, of brain function. And of course, in the world of longevity, there's also a huge amount of work going into what are the preventative steps that you can take to keep your brain healthy. Uh, and it's pretty simple, I'm afraid. It's healthy heart, healthy head, most of the things that are good for your heart, exercise, diet, not smoking, not drinking too much, losing weight, not like me. All those things are good for your brain as well as for your heart. And so there's a lot of research going into that as well. And, and I'm sure it'll be an incredibly rewarding moment when, when that uh, discovery is, is cemented. Um, just to wrap things up, David, you mentioned at the start you know, uh, why you, you chose to focus in this area. And, and I, just to go back to that topic, but in a slightly different angle, I'm sure you had so many options uh, of which charities to, to focus your attention on uh, after, after leaving office and obviously needed to prioritize that. Uh, I guess looking back on the progress made so far and your hopes for the future, are you pleased that this was your top pick? Yeah, totally. It was my top pick because it was the thing, uh, I mean, in, in, in health in government, I, as well as, you know, <laughs> dealing with the enormous issue of how to try and improve our national health service and make it work better and all the rest of it, I really picked two things aside from that central question in the health um, space. One was genomics where I think Britain has the potential to be a real leader. And so I set up Genomics England, which had the world's first, really, 
um, population genomics program. We sequence 100,000 people's genomes to try and crack rare childhood diseases and rare cancers. And it's been an amazing success story, now being copied the world over. And it's now not 100,000 genomes. We're going to a million and then five million, and it's going to be, it's transformational. And one of the advantages of our health service is because, you know, you don't leave it like an American insurer where everyone turns over and joins another health. We have incredible longitudinal data. So you combine things like Genomics England with our health service, we can be real leaders in research. My second thing was um, uh, the issue of dementia, which I got um, particularly passionate about because I could just see what was happening just going around care homes in my constituency and just seeing these, I never forget, you know, seeing sons visiting their mothers and the mother just, you know, even in sometimes in their 60s and 70s, perfectly physically healthy, but not recognizing um, their 40-year-old child at all and the pain and agony of that that so many people have been through and the sense that this is growing so rapidly because, of course, while dementia is not caused by aging, the more we solve the other health problems, the more people don't get cancer because they've stopped smoking or get cured from cancer because of the progress we're making, the more people don't have a heart attack because we're taking statins and exercising regularly and not eating you know, all the things we shouldn't eat, the greater chances there are that you will live on and get one of these diseases of the brain. So it seems to me this is absolutely the, the health priority that we should focus on, on and, and, and I'm focused on. And obviously, the raising of the money is hugely important because we're so far behind. But I think there's also something that ex-prime ministers can do of sort of convening the scientists, the experts, the technologists, and trying to drive them forward, which is what EDON is, is all about. So that's why I chose it. I, I find it incredibly interesting, frustrating by moments because, you know, you want to go further and faster. Um, but I think the vaccine task force gave us all hope that things that can take 10 years can be concertinaed into one. And if we do that, the idea of that pill I talked about being available in, in a few years' time is not, is not outlandish. Well, David, uh, we thank you for your time today, but perhaps even more so for, that, for, for this work you're doing with uh, Alzheimer's Research UK. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good to see you.